is our God. Oh, how great our God. Oh, how great, how great. Can you sing it with me? How God. Thank you, Brother Steve. Oh, how great is our God. our God. Sing it now, how great, how great is our God. One more time. How great is our God. Oh, think about it. How great is our God. Sing it now, how great. hallelujah how many know how great he is today oh yes amen can somebody stand up and tell me how great he's been this week to you I just love that I love to hear the testimonies you know what Paul he was he was probably one of the greatest if not the greatest preacher in that New Testament church but when he started off talking to somebody, he never started with his most famous sermon, his latest, greatest revelation. You know what he'd say? He said, I was on my way to Damascus. I had the papers in my pocket that said I could kill Christians if they didn't deny Jesus. And he said, a bright light knocked me off my horse blinded me he said I couldn't I couldn't see a thing and he said and I heard this loud voice now to all the men that were with him it sounded like thunder but Paul heard the words Saul Saul why persecutest thou me and I said who are you Lord he knew it was the Lord didn't he and he said, the Lord told me, I'm Jesus. <laughs> and when you persecute my kids, you're persecuting me. Come on. Oh, that's how great he is. How great is our God. Oh, how great is our God. Sing it now, how great. How great is our God. It didn't matter if he was talking to some, somebody standing on a street corner or whether he was talking to a king in a throne room. He started off with, I, one day I was on my way to Damascus. And I met Jesus. <laughs> one place he wrote, he said, am I not free? Am I not an apostle? He said, have I not seen the Lord's Christ for myself? Amen. He said, he saw him face to face. Is our God. It might be a bright light that blinds you for a while. It might be a loud voice that sounds like thunder. Let me tell you what, you're never going to forget the moment that you meet Jesus. <laughs> I hope somebody meets him today. I want to meet him. I want to see him every chance I get. You know, he's here, isn't he? He's right here with us. Amen. And what I love about this is because this is 40 years ago. God gave us a vision, you know, right out of Bible college. And I told my dad about it. I said, Dad, I want to move pulpits off the platform or, or at least make them out of plastic so you can see through them. So they're not distracting from Jesus and what he wants to do. Well, that's true. You say, now you shouldn't talk about the pulpit like that. Well, anything that distracts people from what Jesus is trying to do, yeah. it, it's not sacred to me. Amen. Amen. You say, well, now, what, how's the preacher going to, where's he going to put his Bible if he doesn't have a pulpit? Well, first of all, the pulpit, there's, it's mentioned one time in it, Brother Steve, in the Old Testament, and they didn't stand behind it. They stood on top of it. <laughs> that was the pulpit. Amen. <clears throat> And you know what? Oh. <laughs> That's right, I forgot. 
when I first met Brother Jack, he was over there in that old brick building, you know. And he, he did that. Yeah, he climbed right up on top. And I was thinking, oh, Lord, where's the back door? <laughs> he, he was. And you know what? So you see, these things are, they're not, and, and they're not sacred. They're just, they're things we use for, for as long as we need them. Now, other churches, I won't mention their name, but other churches use the pulpit. It had a door in it, and they put a, the Bible in it, and the door closed, and it had a lock on it. Yeah. And they locked the Bible, the Word of God, in the pulpit because they didn't want the saints to try to read it. Because first of all, they were too stupid to know what they were reading. That's what, that's what the priests taught. Second of all, I don't think they really want them to know what was in the Bible. <laughs> because they weren't teaching it. And they're still not, but I won't mention any names. But they've got pulpits that you can't see through. <laughs> now, the reason I like this one is because you can just look up here and you can see what God's doing. And 40 years ago, we thought it would be a good idea to, to put chairs up here. Like, see Brother Jack sitting and see he's relaxed. Like, he sits at home just like that. And he ministers and, and he talks about God just like at church. He's at church all the time. He's never not at church because you know why? He is the church. That's it. That's it. Amen. <laughs> we are the church everywhere we go that's where Jesus is you know why because you take him there <laughs> amen Christ in us is this world's hope of glory amen and so we thought well you know it'd be a good idea if folks knew that Jesus was with them everywhere they went and that they could sing songs and worship God they could pop a CD on in their CD player and worship God in their living room sitting on their couch and we thought you know what that's a good idea let's put a couch up there and so I did the pastors that weren't too spiritual to let me move their pulpits off of the platform I, we would set couches on the living room with a little uh, little end table and a, and a little lamp and turn it on it was pretty and it, it gave you the feeling that you were sitting in in a living room at home and then when God starts moving and the power of God starts falling and people start receiving the blessings of God and the worship is, is amazing. It, what, what's the image that's in your mind? That's right. It's a living room. It's a home. It's a family. Not some religious trappings. Not traditional. Traditional. How many is tired of playing church? I heard your pastor preaching a little bit about that. And he probably won't ever quit until we quit playing. Because you know what? This religious stuff, is made, it was made by man. Yeah. And it distracts what God's trying to do. Sometimes it confuses us. We think, oh, you can only feel God when there's a pulpit and when there's a choir and when there's a, a, a pipe organ. Amen. You remember the, the cathedral, the cathedral uh, images that are in our minds? When you think of church, what do you see? If I ask you that question, what do you see when you think of church? Well, pews. Thank God we got rid of them. Thank God. Amen. You're always bumping your shins on them. They're a lot harder to move than these chairs, and they're, they're hard. They're made out of boards. <laughs> That's true. I never did like it. There's a lot of, I never did like religion. I love Jesus. Yeah. Am I sounding like your preacher right now? <laughs> it's because we got one thing in common. We, we, know, we know the same. We've got the same Lord. His name is Jesus. And we have to serve him. We serve our Lord Jesus. We've made him. We've accepted him as our Savior, but we've made him our Lord. Hallelujah. I love the story of the prodigal son. When he came home, you listen, he'd been out in the hog pen. You know? he'd, he'd spent all of his inheritance. He was flat broke, out there feeding some farmer's hogs, and so hungry he was thinking about joining in them with them for lunch <laughs> and filling his bellies with the 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 husk the corn husk that he's feeding the hog and he thought to himself my father's servants have it better than this <laughs> he said I'm gonna go home and when I get home I'm gonna tell him dad I just I'm not worthy to be your son just let me be your servant just treat me like another servant and and let me and feed me and take care of me just like a sir I want to be your servant dad but when he got home, guess what? His father saw him from the front porch, jumped off of the porch, and ran to meet him. Threw his arms around him and said, My son who was lost has now come home. come home. And he said, And Dad, all I want to do is just serve you. 
And he said, go get the robe. We're going to put a fine robe. He, this is my son. I'm going to put the ring on his finger. He said, I'm going to kill the fatted calf and give him, give him a, 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 a feast in his honor because he's my son. But you know what? He came home not as a proud, arrogant father's son, but he came home with the heart of a servant. He was still the son. He was still, he was still, he had everything that he would ever have in that household except one thing. He, he now came to serve his father. And that's the generation we're living in today. We, we are the sons of God. I mean, we are the blessed. We are the chosen generation, the royal priesthood. We're the holy nation. But you know what? We've got servants' hearts because we've been out there long enough to know that it's not all about us. It's about him. It's about him. All about Jesus. Amen. Praise God. That's good to know, isn't it? God told me to brag on his kids. That's what he wants me to do. I've been seeking him. I said, Lord, just if you were here right now, Jesus, I've never asked him that question. I probably should have 40 years ago. But they didn't teach me to do that in Bible college. Get it? They never taught me to ask God what he wanted to say. Yeah. <laughs> That's, it'd be funny if it wasn't so sad, right? But you know what? I asked him, I said, Lord, what would you say to your people if you were here? And you know what he told me? You, they're my kids. I'd be bragging on them. Right There's nobody loves a child as much as a parent. Are you kidding me? <laughs> it could be the meanest kid in school. And you say, you know, uh, Mr. Uh, Mr. So-and-so, you know, uh, your boy is just really acting up. He's like the, the, the worst kid in the class. He's like, yeah, yeah, but he, look, he's perfect, though. Look at him. He looks just like me. <laughs> Parents, they don't even, you know, sometimes they see, you know, they see what they see. And that's why God is. I'm telling you. You say, yeah, but I'm, a, I'm terrible. I'm horrible. I'm fa I fail every time I try to do anything for God. You know what? But he sees you perfect. He's looking at you through his blood. The blood. Hallelujah. You're forgiven. Wow, we could just stop right there and just run the aisles, Woo! couldn't we? <laughs> We're forgiven. We've got a daddy that loves us. And he wants me to just tell you how proud he is of every one of you. Say, so, well, yeah, but what about, you know, Sister Sonsa? He's proud of her, too. Well, I mean, you know, but what about, I know, he's proud. He loves everybody out, but siblings, that's the way siblings are, right? Well, I'll tell you one thing. That, my brother of mine. <laughs> uh, but you know what? God just, he sees through all that. And his love is enough to keep the family together, okay? It is, yeah. And a lot of times when parents pass, you've noticed uh, I remember we, my great grandmother had eight, nine children, I think. Well, eight that they claimed. They're, you know, there's always that one. <laughs> but you know what? They got together family, family dinners, and I remember all the family coming. My, my, gra my grandmother, she was one of, uh, of uh, four child, uh, daughters, and, and then there were uh, four boys. And they, they'd get together, their families got together, and the kids, and we were all the cousins. We had tons of cousins, and we just had the greatest times. And boy, she could put those, put that big pot of beans on, you know, beans and cornbread. Oh, Ola, Ola was her name. She was. Uh, we, we had a had a fellow in the church that was always making jokes, you know, those kind of people. There's one in every crowd, and he told me one day, he said, "I'm going, I'm having a new, uh, new baby girl, and I'm going to name her after your great grandmother." I said, "Really?" His his name is Brother Cross, Charlie Cross, and I said, "Ola, he's, her name's going to be Ola." He said, "Yeah." He said, you know, and, and he said, and guess what her middle name's going to be? I said, I don't know. He said, Rugged. <laughs> Ola Rugged Cross. <laughs> I know. I know. <laughs> a merry heart maketh good like a medicine, doesn't it? But when that great-grandmother passed away, you know what? At those, those family get-together stopped. We, we still had the grandmothers and their families. And, We'd get together with him. But then when the grandmother passed away, went on to be with Jesus in that great, in that great uh, family reunion upstairs, well, then it, less people got together. And then, you know, as the parents passed, you know, it's uh, sooner or later, you know, you, don't, you just don't have that, that, uh, that bond and, that we have as, as, as the church. You know, a lot of times the family, we meet together more in, as a church family than our, our, our natural family. But you see, that's because God never going to pass away. Well, he did once, but he came back. <laughs> you 
Amen. And he's not going to leave. He said, I'll never leave you or forsake you. And that daddy just keeps his, he wants his family together and he wants us loving each other and being here. And the preacher's right this morning. He's right once in a while. And he was right this morning when he said, uh, <laughs> when he said that, what'd you say? Oh, I know. He said that you don't, don't expect him to make all the phone calls, you know, when somebody's here. Hey, if, if, you're, if your brother's sitting, if you have a dinner, and it's a special family dinner, the food's prepared and smelling good, and, and, and you know, somebody doesn't show up, what do you do? Well, you get on the phone and say, hey, dude, where are you at? The food's getting cold. <laughs> you know what I mean? Don't wait till next week to call. If they're not here at, the, at God's dinner table, call them up at five minutes after ten. <laughs> say, hey, y'all all right? You need a ride? We'll come and get you. Church is starting. We've got come and die, and the master calleth, come and die. The preacher's going to feed us that spiritual food today. How often do we eat the Word of God? If it's only at church, that's just a couple times a week. Now, do you only eat physical food a couple times a week? Hello. I know, I'm, I'm meddling. I'll leave that to your pastor. Give us this day our daily bread. Amen. You got to get that manna was fresh every morning when they were, tra they were wandering in that wilderness. It was fresh manna every morning for them. Now, if they, and you couldn't save it. You couldn't store it up and say, well, I'm just going to get a couple extra uh, buckets of the manna and, and won't have to go to church this week. <laughs> but you know what happened to the manna? If you tried to save it so you didn't have to get up early the next morning and go to Sunday school, guess what? When you got up that morning for breakfast, it was rotten. That's right. So it's got to be fresh manna every day. Amen. Come and hear you preach and preach. This is fantastic what you're doing up here. Am I supposed to sing? Why am I holding this guitar? <laughs> this is wonderful. Brother, Brother Scott and Brother Steve. And this, this is, you know what Jesus said? Greater things than these shall ye do. We never imagined. Look, we thought, well, I guess we're going to heal more blind people or we're going to, you know, more raise more from the dead or something. I don't know. But look at this. This is greater things. I mean, everyone with an iPhone, which is just about everybody, they can pull this up, can't they? Off the internet, and you can Bible studies, counseling. Next time your wife starts honking at you about something, just pull up that app and say, there, honey, marriage counseling. Listen. Just listen to that right there. <laughs> the best I got is on my phone. I took a picture of a stop sign and put it on my screensaver. So, when, you know, when I still hear that honking start, I just push that button, and, and it pulls up a red stop sign, and I just go like that. Sing, oh, that's right. Greater things than these. You know why? Because the latter house shall be greater than the former. Amen? The glory of the latter house. Now, remind me, because I want to preach about that a little later. Remind me I said that, Brother Phil. On the journey again. I'm so glad to be on that journey again. Life... My lifetime love is praising Jesus with my friends. I can't wait to get on the journey again. Sing it with me on the journey again. Just can't wait to get on the journey again. My lifetime love is praising Jesus with my friends. I can't wait to get on that journey again. I'm glad to be on the journey today. How about you? On the journey again Just a band of Christians We go down the highway We're the best of friends Existing that the world Keeps turning our way Heaven's highway On the journey again Clap your hands everybody I just can't wait to get on that journey again Time to love is praising Jesus With my friends I can't wait to get on that journey again. I think I hurt myself. No. There's one other thing I want to say about it. <laughs> you may be seated. There's one other thing I want to say. It's fun being a Christian. You know that? That's the best kept secret in the whole wide world. Yeah, some churches do a real good job of keeping it a secret too. <laughs> Amen. I don't like religion. It killed my Lord. And it's still killing Jesus. Uh-oh. You back to that, you know, this living room thing here. Big pretty couch sitting there, you know, next to it with that lamp stand and, and a, a coffee table. If you drink, if you drink coffee. 
I asked one preacher, I said, uh, what kind of coffee you like? He said, oh, brother, I, we, don't, we don't even smoke. <laughs> I said, yeah, no, me neither. I, hot chocolate will be fine. <laughs> Paul said, <laughs> I'll be all things to all men. <laughs> if by any means I might win some. <laughs> if drinking coffee offends my brother, I won't drink coffee till Jesus comes. <laughs> And then I hope he's got a big pot going in heaven. Hey, you know what? Couch, living room, get it? You say, well, yeah, but, you know, we can't play the guitar. We can't play the drums, the piano. We, you know, it's not going to be like church. Ah, oh, we got an idea. Put on a CD and worship to it. Say, yeah, well, okay, but that's not like church. We don't play CDs at church. Oh. But known unto God are all his works. From the beginning of the world. Hallelujah. He has it all planned out. He knows from the beginning to the end. And so look, he knew someday we'd be playing CDs and worshiping God. What I'm trying to say is you can take the very experience you're having right here and take it into your living room and have it in home, in your home for your family and friends. Isn't that wonderful? You can have church in your house. And I got Bible for that. Remember, Paul? He said, to the church in thy house. He was greeting all the brethren in one of his letters. And he said, and to the church in thy house. Hallelujah. That's the scripture that got me going on this, Brother Steve. And, I, and my dad said, you know, son, you're going to preach yourself out of a job. <laughs> That's what he always said. I, I want the pastor. God bless the children. Jesus, Jesus loves the little children. All the children of the world Red and yellow, black and white They are precious in His sight Jesus loves the little children of the world Woo! Woo! Everybody sing to Him Jesus loves the little children God bless y'all, have fun today All the children of the world Red and yellow, black and purple They are precious in His sight Jesus loves the little children of the world Amen, that's all I got <laughs> but now I used to use that as a trick you know to throw the devil off because I'd preach my entire sermon and just hold a guitar like that and the devil knew I never knew I started preaching <laughs> I know I just squeeze it right in there you know and because as soon as you start preaching open the Bible stand up there it's like phew, everything goes flat you know you ever felt that yeah and then the devil just says yeah okay show me give me your best shot you know but we can trick him. We can throw him off. He, he knows what's going to happen in a traditional religious service. You know, he goes to church more than most of us do. He's there every time the door opens. He don't, he's not worried about the people out there. In the way he's got them. It's the church people he's interested in. He'll cur curl up right next to you there on, on your seat, and he'll say, uh, <clears throat> well, you know, he don't know what he's talking about. Or this song. Listen, how many times have you heard that song? But is that the only song she knows, you know? These are the things going through our minds. Well, now, it's about time for, for the offering. When's he going to take up that offering, you know? Or uh, how about testimony service? Oh, no, not him again. He says the same thing every time he comes to church. Doesn't he love anybody but Jesus? <laughs> That's all he wants to talk about. <laughs> and these things are going through his mind because, see, he heads us off at the past. It's like when we do a traditional service, three songs, uh, testimony, take up the offering, and then the, the preacher preach. Well, the devil, we're giving him his ga our game plan. We said, here you go. This is what we're going to do. And he heads us off at the pass every time. But when you keep him guessing, you know, wondering what's going to happen next. That's, that's what Jesus does in our lives. He, he keeps the devil guessing. And then he, we can stay ahead of him. Amen. So this just feels like we're sitting in our living room, doesn't it? Feeling the presence of God, prayer, and and. Uh, Worship, and, uh, and this is the way it's supposed to be. This, this just, you know what the church is? The, the home is not an, ex, is an extension of our traditional religion. This, this church, this church is an extension of our homes. Amen. We got it backwards. What we do at, in the, at home and what we have in our families, we bring that to this building. And by the way, I got it, and, and, and it's wonderful, and it's glorious. And Jesus is here where two or three are gathered in my name. He said, I'll be there. If it's in your home, in your living room, or even if it's in a, in a building that, you, that we have uh, um, 
I can't think of another word, ignorantly called the church for, for many, many years. And uh, this, isn't, this isn't the church. You are the church. This is the building that you meet in. And you know what? I've got to tell you, it's beautiful. Look at the work here that's been done. And, and hallelujah. Look, give yourselves a hand. God's proud of you. He's proud of his kids. Amen. And they walked me through last night. And they said, look how beautiful this is. And I thought, oh, I was getting the grand tour. Look at this. This room, and it's beautiful. And back here, we've got the store. And look over here, we need to lay down some carpet. You want to you take your jacket off there and get your <clears throat> get down on your knees there while I give, and you squeeze the glue on. And I'll <laughs> I said, no, you do the glue. I'll, I'll do the cutting. And I cut the carpet. And, and, you know, it was just, it was perfect when we got through with it. Amen. Perfect. Because, you know, God's, we ought to try to do perfect stuff for God, right? Amen. He loves us. We, we ought to try to. I, I wanted to, my parents to be proud of me. I tried to do the best I could. It wasn't my fault that I didn't please them. Oh, excuse me, that's another subject. <laughs> I, I have a little baggage there. <laughs> we'll, <clears throat> yeah, I know, I need therapy. <sighs> okay, breathe. <sighs> But that's the way people, that's what religion will do to you. It'll make you feel like you, have, you can't do enough to please God. God's mad at you. He hates you. You fail. You, you mess up every time you do. Have you ever heard that, that voice before? Now, you know, God don't want you feeling that way about your parents or him. But, you know, it's easy for us to never feel like we ever quite did enough. Uh, that's why parents need to tell their kids they're proud of them, you know, just... Amen. Sure. Tell them. Say, you know, you, that's okay. You, you spilt the milk. Well, you know what? We got more milk. Just, you know, you do it every time we eat, but that's okay. That's, we'll just buy more milk. <laughs> Forgiveness. You know, they kind of feel like I still spill milk and dodge every time I do it. <laughs> My wife said, you okay? I said, yeah, I'm fine. Just spilt the milk. It's okay. Spilt milk. <laughs> That's what religion does. It makes you feel like you can't do enough. You can't. You got to earn your salvation. You better watch out now. It's not by works of righteousness which we have done, but according to His mercy, He saves us by the washing of regeneration. Right over there, He'll wash you clean in the name of Jesus Christ, Yeshua Hamashiach. He will wash your sins away by the washing of regeneration. And regenerate you. Something happens. You change when you go down in water in the name of Jesus Christ. I'm going to preach about that here in a minute. Amen. And renewing of the Holy Ghost. Hallelujah. Renewing of that Holy Ghost. I'm every day, you're a new creature in Christ. Hallelujah. The Bible says, old things have passed away. Behold, all things have become new. Don't you love that? A new creature in Christ. Hmm. What was I talking about? How did I get off on that? <laughs> Don't you love when a preacher says, well, how did I get off on that? I can get my sermons right here. I got the notes. I don't know how I got off on that. It might have been God. <laughs> now, see, here's the thing. You don't have to. You know, when you meet in your home and have your Bible studies or, or uh, devotions with your family, you don't have to put on your three-piece suit and stand up on the coffee table and say, now let's all stand, shall we? <laughs> you say, if we don't do that, we won't know when we're in the presence of God. I know, that's my point. These things have, have you know, they've, they've confused our minds and we think that Jesus isn't, you know, just anywhere and everywhere you need Him. So what I'm saying is, you can just be you. You can just be yourself. You don't, you, God can use, he can speak through you. We called a preacher. We were talking about a preacher that I knew 40 years ago when he first got saved. And the next thing I know, Pastor Jack's handed me the telephone. He's called him up. I haven't talked to the guy in 40 years. What if I'd been lying and I didn't even know the guy? You, you awkward. <laughs> don't try to lie to him. <laughs> And the guy said, yeah, oh, are you kidding me? Wow, see, he just got saved. and He was a Bible, a, a college student at IU, Indiana University. Oh, he's been here, hasn't he? Brother Al Gosson. 
He's been here. Well, he just got saved. He didn't know any Christian songs. And they, somebody handed him, he, we heard he could play the guitar and sing. Somebody handed him a guitar. So he started singing. Like a bridge over troubled water, I will let you know. He didn't even change the words to Jesus. He didn't. <laughs> he just sang bridge over troubled water. <laughs> Saints, oh, yes, Lord. Saints worship it. They did they didn't know Simon and Garfunkel. <laughs> yes. Oh, that bridge. I need that bridge. <laughs> and, and you know, so, so Brother Jack calls him up. He, says, <laughs> he calls him and says, Brother Al, you, did, did, you sing, did you sing Bridge Over Treble Water <laughs> at the church in Martinsville, Indiana? He said, oh, my goodness gracious. <laughs> oh, and he remembered. And, uh, and so we talked to him. We, we were just talking, you know, just talking like, hey, it's good to, to, to hear things are going well and just catching up, saying things that's coming to our minds. You know, conversation is a lost art nowadays. You know what I mean? I mean, you know, they're, they're sitting across the table from one another at McDonald's doing this. And, and they're talking to each other. Like you, three feet away. How you doing? Not bad. How about you? Yeah, it could be better. I mean, like what? <laughs> A lost art, you know, and, and to conversation, it, you know, it is something you learn to do because you, you say something, then they say something, and then you say something else, and then they say something else, and, and then you say something else, <laughs> and they say something else. Like that. Unless you're talking to Brother Lloyd, and you say something, then he says something, and then something, and then something, and then something, and then something. <laughs> but you know what? It's always good, though, isn't it, <laughs> Sister Pepper? <laughs> it's always good. But you know, when, hey, when God's got, got something for you to say, say it. Amen? Because you know what? It edifies. We edify one another. We build one another up. We're working on the building when we do that. When we're talking to one another. We're, brother Al, you know, we just said some things we felt on our hearts. And, and then he said, he's, he's on the other line. He's trying to hold back the tears. <laughs> Brother, God's talking to me. That's exactly what God's been telling me. <laughs> we were like, okay, whatever. We'll see you later. I go. <laughs> but God, he got to brag on his kid. Yeah. yeah, it may not mean anything to you what you say to somebody, but it means the world to them because it's, I've heard, had, you know, when people say to you years later, say, you know, your, your dad was very proud of you. He said the greatest things about you. And I'm saying, wait, wait a minute. You talking about my dad? <laughs> You know, some dads, they're not real mushy. You know, they don't have a lot to say. But, uh, you know, you, and you hear later how much they just bragged and thought the world of you. Well, how great is that? Not even, not even coming from your dad, but from someone that knew your dad that's telling you how your dad felt about you. It makes you feel great, doesn't it? Yeah. Amen. That's what we do when we edify one another. We tell one another. We let them know how much their daddy loves them. Praise God. Amen, that's right. Now, my mother, that's a different story. She loved me too. She fed me good, can't you tell? She's a good cook. Yeah. And so, I'll tell you what God, he's, he's wanting us, he's wanting me, I feel like he's wanting me to be less and less religious. The less religious, and said, but how are people going to know you're in church? I don't want them to think they're, that they are in church. I want them to know that God wants them to be the church. If I do anything up here that you can't do in your living room, then I'm not being an example to you for you to follow. You understand what I'm saying? That's right, because that's where you're going to do your preaching. Yeah. Hallelujah. Yeah. That's where my wife does her preaching. Just kidding you. Phil saying, no, you're not. <laughs> but that's it. See, we, what, we, what are we? we? What we do here. We, it's the training center right here. The training center. We're training to send you out to go into this world every day. Because we're just here a couple times, three times a week. That's all. But you get trained. You get you learned by, here's the word. Amen. Pastor said it today. Impartation. Not just Information impartation when we come to this house and we meet together something flows between us 
back and forth from one of the, the fivefold ministry. We've talked about it before. The apostle, prophet, evangelist, pastor, and teacher. When they stand here before you, it's not just to pre preach their latest, greatest sermon and to tickle your ears or make you, wow, wasn't that a great sermon or whatever. That's not what it's about. We're up here to whatever we're doing. It's to make you, to perfect you. Yeah. The fivefold ministry is for the perfecting of the saints, the work of their ministry, and the edifying, the building up of the body. We've got to be building you. I'm sorry that we have bullied you. I'm sorry we beat up on you. I'm telling you the truth. I apologize for stupid preachers. I'm, I was one. We beat up on his kids. We bully his kids. You know what happens when you bully somebody's child? They better not find out about it. My mom had come out of that house like a wet hen. I, see, I, we lived on East Columbus Street, 810 East Columbus Street in my elementary years. And all the kids there thought I was Superman. Had my hair, had that little curl hanging down, you know. <clears throat> I'd put, I had a pajamas that had, looked like a Superman suit with an S on right there. And I wore them underneath my Easter my Easter suit with my white shirt and tie in the middle of summer I sweat pouring you know and I'd say come here I'd open up that top button in there I'd show them my ass was underneath that white shirt and see when they weren't there I, could, I was the only one that could climb the street the street uh, uh, sign thank you brother I appreciate that I was the only one that could climb the street sign you know like, like this like the, like the monkey and I'd climb up it and then I sit on top of the, uh, Columbus Street and Colfax. And I'd be sitting, when they come out of the house, I'd be sitting up there in my Superman suit. How you doing? <laughs> they thought I was Superman. And then, you know, I'd jump off the sign and fly down, cape in the wind, land on the ground. <laughs> so we moved from there, but my parents found this beautiful big two-story house. Oh, yeah. On 510 West Washington Street. And so that's where we moved when I went into junior high and high school. And, uh... Everybody on that street bullied me for five years. Bullied every day. My friends, they, they acted like they were my friends. And I'd go out and play and, until they got me over at McDaniel's barn and then they'd throw rotten eggs or drag me around on the ground or hold me and, hold me and let their little brothers hit me in the stomach. Just bully. Bully. I, I didn't know why. I didn't understand. They were supposed to be my friends. And then I realized that's what religion, God's telling me now, that's what religion does to my kids. And there's nobody understands it any better than I do because I, for five years, until my grandpa finally came to my, my dad and said, I found a farm out north of town. You need to get those boys off, off, of, that, out, uh, off of that Washington Street. Take them out of town. And so the last, the last couple years of our high school, my high school, I spent on a farm with horses and, 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 and uh, cattle and sheep and pigs and chickens and just gave me a whole different outlook on life. But you know what? I never forgot what it felt like to be bullied. And I know why God, you say, well, why, did, why would a God that loves you? I gave my heart to God when I was 12. I went through this as a Christian. Why would God treat this fine little 12, 13, 14, 15 year old little boy trying to serve him? Why did you have to go through that? Because God wanted me to know how his kids feel when religion bullies them and makes them feel like they can never be good enough. To please God and I'm gonna tell you something he what he did on that cross hallelujah don't you spit in his bloody face and tell me that what he did on that cross wasn't enough to save your soul because that's what saves us our faith in him and his death and his burial and his resurrection oh hallelujah yeah there's more that comes along after but that's what saves you your faith in that. But when you're told, oh yeah, but no, you got to do this, you got to do that. And if you don't do this, then you're not going to heaven. And if you, can, and if you do that, you, you, can't, you can't make it. You can't be saved because you got to do this and you got to do that. And let me tell you something. What that does, the bad, and, and some of that might be true. There may be some things we shouldn't do. But what it does when you hear that religious voice all the time, it kills your faith. That's the tragedy. It kills your faith because you can't believe that the blood of Jesus Christ cleanses your sins. 
cleanseth, the Bible says. That cleanseth word means continually. Not just one time. Woo, but every day. <laughs> oh, I need his blood every day. Every day. When he looks at me, he sees perfection. Now, the pastor don't, but Jesus does. But that's why Jesus gave you the pastor. Because you'll say, well, you might want to work on the rough edges here a little bit. Let's, let's do some sanding on that little rough edge right there. <laughs> Remember, the guy that owned the, the orchard, he found, the, he found the, the husbandman. He told him, he said, hey, how long has this tree down here on the end not been bearing fruit? How long? Yeah. Well, it's, it's, been, you know, it's been there a while. Well, then why don't we just cut it down and plant a tree there that will bear fruit? And the husbandman says to the owner of the orchard, well, Okay, I, I see your point, but you know, maybe just give me one more year. Yeah. How about that, huh? Just one more year. Let me dig around it, fertilize it, trim the dead branches off of it. One more, give me one more year, God. That's what your preacher's praying. When you have exhausted, literally exhausted the mercy of God, you say, wait a minute, his mercy never, his mercy endures forever. Yeah, but you know what? There is such a thing as a reprobate mind. If the Bible says, if you don't love the truth, I mean love the truth, love it, then finally God gets fed up. And you know what the Bible says he will do? God will send a strong delusion. I'm, this is the Bible, this isn't me. God will send a strong delusion that you will believe a lie and be damned. Because you know why? Because you're taking up space. Because you're sitting here being a hypocrite. Because you're a bad witness. That's right. And God, he, you know what he did? He said, you've not chosen me. I've chosen you and ordained you. That you should bring forth fruit. And that your fruit should remain. That's why you're here. And you know what that preacher's doing? Well, you know what? Look, this kind of looks like fruit. You think maybe, yeah, no, it's not. But you, let me work on just a little bit more. Let me, they're going to pray. They're going to start praying. They're going to read the Bible. I, t I teach them every week to read the Bible. They're going to do it. They're going to start loving each other. They're going to do it. They're going to, they're going to start being what, everything you want them to be, Jesus. You know, Moses was the same way. God got fed up with Israel. They had just, to the, to the limit. And he said, just move out of the way, Moses. I'm going to just make the earth swallow them up. Kill them all. All, all three, four, five million, however many it was. I'm done. I'm done with them. It's over. Just done. And you know what Moses said? He said, Moses, I'll raise up a new nation of you. It won't be the sons of Abraham. It'll be the sons of Moses. Yeah. They won't even remember Abraham. We'll just start over. Moses, mm, boy, you mean, would my name be on the church sign? Yeah. Yep. <laughs> no, he didn't say that. <laughs> Moses, Pastor Moses, well, okay. No, you know what Moses said? If you kill them, God, you kill me too. Woo, man. I'm not kidding you. That's the kind of pastors we got today. We've got pastors that are, they, they've all, they're already dead. They died a long time ago. And they said, we're going to be here. We're, you know why he's here? He's not here because he's got the, the glory of this latter house is greater than that of the former. That old brick building back there, nobody wanted to go to. Even religious people didn't want to go to that church. Couldn't even get saved people to go there. <laughs> But look what God did. Look at the glory of this latter house. Hallelujah. In a mall? Are you kidding, Brother Jack? Are you, have you lost your marbles? You've got to be kidding. In a mall? A, a mall there's, sinners are in the mall. Yeah. <laughs> right? That's what they told Jesus. How can you be eating with publicans? Your stirs right out there where sinners are walking by. They're going to see you. They might come in and eat a donut. Dear Lord, they might even repent and get saved. <laughs> right? Amen. That's the, that's the object. That's the whole point. That's the... <laughs> I don't have to say too much more about that, do I? Because I can talk about this all day. Ishmael hated Isaac. Ishmael. He was the oldest son. He deserved all the inheritance. Abraham... Yeah, not Isaac, that squally little baby. Ishmael hated him. When no one was looking, he'd pinch him. Terrorized him. He was a big brother, mean big brother. 
Ishmael. He wasn't God's idea. That's right. Abraham and Sarah got together and cooked that one up. Said, Hagar, you know, she can bear children. Someone born in your house is your heir. That's religion is what that is. You're trying to figure out what God wants to do. God knows what he wants to do. From the beginning. From the beginning of the world are all his work his works are known to him. I'm gonna read my text here in a minute. He knows what he's doing. Isaac was the promised child. Ishmael terror, he was a terrorist. He still is. Amen. So we're still being terrorized in the natural world and the spiritual world. Ishmael, you know who Ishmael is? Ishmael is your denomination. Your man-made religious organization. Your ecclesiastical system that was born of flesh, not of the spirit. He said, Isaac's going to be a miracle child, Sarah. You're going to give birth. I know you're 90 years old, but you're going to give birth to that baby. And she laughed. Sarah laughed out. Well, wouldn't you? Who wouldn't? <laughs> she laughed out loud. So you know what? They just named him laughter no no not the word laughter they named him the sound of laughter Isaac's name was <laughs> that was Isaac's name it was the sound of laughter <laughs> yeah his laughter makes you feel good doesn't it try it <laughs> Come on, it doesn't matter. <laughs> it just feels good. It's, it's good. Laughter's good. Isaac was good. Ishmael was bad. Man-made religion is still bad. But you let, because you know why? It kills Jesus. It terrorizes the, the spiritual purpose of God in the earth. It's counterproductive to everything God wants his church to do. We make it so Im so difficult to find God. You put, when you bring them into a religious service, they feel awkward. They feel uncomfortable. They don't know how to act. They don't know. They don't. He say, "Okay, well, after you've, after we've preached our sermon, sung every sad song we can think of, we said, now come on up here and bow down here, sinner. God's mad at you. He he hates you. you know, that's the feeling they get. Instead of telling them, saying, you know what, God loves His children." And he wants to adopt you. You may, not have been, you may not have been a part of this family yet, but by the spirit of adoption, he's going to make you one of us. Yes. Just like he made us one of the Jewish people. Right. Oh, no, no, religion don't like that message. Religion, no, 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 we're not. God, he's turned his back on the Jews. See, they, 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 they messed up. They rejected him. No more Jews. Now it's us, Americans. American Christians. That's what our organization, in fact, if you don't belong to our organization, you're still going to hell. Now, I know it's been said, it's been preached. That's Ishmael. That's Ishmael. But you know what? The part that blows my mind is Abraham. Abraham. He cried out to God when he found out that God wanted, he said, God said, no, it's going to be, it's not going to be Ishmael. It's going to be Isaac is going to be born from you and Sarah. And he cried out to God and said, Oh, God! Oh, that Ishmael may live before thee. Right. You know what he was doing? He loved Ishmael. He was his firstborn son. He loved Ishmael. He didn't want God to, to cast him out. He didn't want to get rid of him. He, he wanted God to accept him. And God said, It's not going to be Ishmael. It's not going to happen with your religious denomination. The revival that this world needs is going to come from my church, my bride, the body of Christ, born of one spirit. We're all baptized into one body. One Hallelujah. One and Jesus is his name. Yeah, I said it, didn't I? Jesus. The Bible says we're going to be hated in this world for one thing. It's not the church you go to. It's not the denomination you belong to. It's not how you dress or look or act or smell. It's going to be... Because of Jesus. That's why they're going to hate you. Amen. Pretty obvious, isn't it? Well, I'm getting carried away, aren't I? That's what we're facing right now. Religious terrorism. We don't need that. I'll tell you what we need right here. <clears throat> Let me show you what happened. They, they had some controversy in the book of Acts. 
15th chapter. Now, in Bible college, we, my, the, the president went around the room and he said, okay, we're going to memorize the book of Acts, the whole book of Acts. Each one of us will memorize a chapter. And then we'll have the book of Acts memorized. And so if religious persecution comes and they nail the doors of the church shut and they take our Bibles away, we'll at least know the book of Acts. Amen? Yeah. That is if we stay together. Because everybody had a chapter. See what I mean? Not a good idea. That's not a bad idea, is it? Amen? If you want the Word of God, everybody memorize part of it, and then you need one another to have the Word. Yeah. Hallelujah! And that's exactly the way it is. We need one another to have the Word of God. We are living epistles, read and known of all men. You know what? Five Gospels. I've said this before. I try to say it every time I preach. And every time I preach, I preach like it's the last time I'll ever get to. And that's pretty obvious, isn't it? I'm trying to pack it all in. <laughs> Five Gospels. Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. And you. And... The strange thing is, most people will never read the first four. But they're going to read you. They're going to read your life. Hallelujah. Well, we went around the room, and I thought, oh, boy, which chapter am I going to get? Okay, chapter 13, chapter 14. And he came to me. He said, chapter 15. And I thought, chapter 15? Oh, I got the Bible out real quick. Flip through it. Let's see, chapter 15. And certain men which came down from Judea taught the brethren and said, oh, no. A business meeting a preacher's conference those are boring to preachers <laughs> and, and you know what that preachers aren't bored it's hard to bore a preacher I, we're excited about everything aren't we just fascinated see now look you take a grain of corn and you make a hole in the ground you cover the dirt up drop the corn in cover the dirt put water on it watered every day and you know what that little grain of corn will grow up into a great big stalk with ears of corn on it. Man, that will preach. <laughs> preachers, they say, it's hard to bore a preacher. We just, but business meeting, are you kidding me? A business meeting. Yeah, it was. <clears throat> Might have been the first one. They called them all together. Said we got, Everybody went to Jerusalem. Okay, this is where it all started. And said, we're going to have to talk about this. Peter and Paul, they're saying that the Gentiles can be saved. You've got to be kidding me. Or in the old English, you've got to be kidding me. Thank you. Gentiles saved. Yeah, I know, I, I know, I know. Peter, he said, look at them. I mean, they're, you know that, brethren, how God has chose a little while ago that the Gentiles by our, by our preaching should hear the gospel. And you know what? Paul came right on in behind him and said, yeah, I know. I, listen, by, they're doing by nature that which is in the law. And they don't even know the law, never heard the law. And they're doing it. Why? Because, well, he said, because they're getting the Holy Ghost just like us. I mean, can we forbid water that they not be baptized? I mean, they're getting the Holy Ghost. They're speaking in tongues. They're getting the love of God is shed abroad in our hearts by that Holy Ghost. And, they're, and by that love, guess what? They're fulfilling the law of Moses. They quit killing, murdering because they love. They quit stealing because they love. They don't commit adultery because they love their wives. They honor their father and mother because they love their father and mother. Love is fulfilling all the law. Can you believe it? And Peter said, you know, that sounds familiar. I think I heard that somewhere before. Yeah. Jesus had been teaching them that all along. I'm sorry that I can't read that clock. This might be a while. But you know what? <clears throat> <laughs> if you get tired, just get up and leave. You know, we're not going to, it won't hurt my feelings. <laughs> if you get hungry, you know. If you think I'm not religious enough. That's right. <clears throat> I want to be Jesus enough. Oh, hallelujah. I want to be Jesus enough. I'm going to bully God's kids. I'm not going to bully the kids of God anymore. I'm going to love you. I'm going to brag on you. I'm going to tell you God's proud of you. You just give it everything you got and he'll take care of the rest. Hallelujah. I'm going to tell you where we came from. Watch this. Right in the middle of this little chapter, it didn't have any miracles. Nobody's blind eyes were healed. Nobody got up. No, no, no dead was raised. No lepers were cleansed. No, nothing happened. Nothing. I mean, they just had a business meeting right in the middle of this. They're going on, and Paul's saying, well, you know, I mean, I, I, again, the Holy Ghost, and Peter's saying, well, 
And then Peter said, they said okay, but they've got to fulfill the whole law of Moses. And Peter said, really? A yoke on the neck of the disciples. You want to put a yoke on the neck of these brand new disciples that neither we nor our fathers were able to bear. No one can live by all that. Are you, the law of Moses, that doesn't save anybody. The law in that it was weak in the flesh, the law could not condemn sin in the flesh. That it was weak in the flesh, but God sending his own son in the likeness of sinful flesh and for sin condemned sin in the flesh. That the righteousness of the law might be fulfilled in us. Woo! Hallelujah. We're the walking Bible right now. You are everything God ever, ever preached. Every, every preacher ever preached. Moses ever taught. Everything that was ever in this Bible, it's in you right now. And, and everybody you meet, they see it because you're God's kid. Woo! Don't you love that? Hallelujah. I'm going to read my text and then... And then I'm done. Most preachers read that first and then preach. <laughs> we did a little different today, didn't we? We tricked the devil. <laughs> proud of myself. You say, oh, oh, proud, proud look, proud, haughty look. It cometh before a fall. Oh, oh, you know, God hates a proud look. Hates it. Well, you just really, <laughs> you're just full of love of God, aren't you? Be packed up, prayed up, and ready to go up. Don't that want to make you be a Christian? <laughs> <clears throat> I'm going to read my text. What chapter was it? Oh, here we go. So they talked about all this. The multitude finally kept silence. Gave audience to Barnabas and Paul, declaring what miracles and wonders God had wrought among the Gentiles by them. And after that, they had held their peace. James, the pastor, finally stood up. <laughs> Amen. James stands up and says, okay, everybody calm down, calm down. Everything's going to be all right. We're going to go eat some dinner here at the huddle house in just a little bit. But let me say this one thing before we go. <sighs> Men and brethren, hearken unto me. Simon Peter hath declared how God at first did visit the Gentiles to take out of them a people for his name. And to this agree the words of the prophet Amos, as a matter of fact. As it is written, after this I will return and will build again the tabernacle of David, which is fallen down. And I will build again the ruins, the ruins thereof. And I will set it up again, that the residue of men might seek after the Lord and all the Gentiles upon whom my name is called saith the Lord who doeth all these things aren't you glad that Pastor James memorized that scripture from Amos he needed it right then didn't he God brought it to his mind and then he finally finished it up by saying known unto God are all his works from the beginning of the world <laughs> He said, we might as well accept it, guys. I mean, I didn't say it. It's not my idea. I don't like them either. I don't like the Gentiles any more than you do. But God said, a people, he's going to bring a people out of the Gentiles upon whom his name is called. That's why he said, go, Jesus said, go ye into all the world. Teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Because, and you know what? Us Gentiles know what that name is, don't we? That name is Jesus. Everybody say it. Stand with me right now. Woo, stand up right now and say, Jesus. The name of the Father, Son, and Holy Ghost is Jesus. And when that name is called upon you, you become his kid. You belong to Jesus. <coughs> Hallelujah. Woo, get that CD ready. We're going to play something jazzy and we're going to worship God here. Amen. You know why? Because the, I want the devil to be afraid of us. He hadn't been too afraid because as long as we're bound by religious tradition, we're not free to do the will of God. We're never going to accomplish his purpose in this world. If we can't get out of the box, but you, we, you know, every church ought to have a glass wall that people can look right in and see what's happening because we're not ashamed of the gospel of Jesus Christ for it's the power of God unto salvation. Woo! 
<coughs> Hallelujah. Glory. <laughs> Better feel good. How about you? We start to act like Steve. Now I know why he acts like this. He's feeling good. Faithful. That's what he is. Faithful man. Been here. She just came and joined Brother Jack. She said, I'll do whatever you need, Jack. What do you want me to do? He said, now I'll preach every Sunday if you want me to, but I'll do whatever you want. That's right. And you know what? Known unto God are all his works from the beginning of the world. Wasn't long ago you were preaching about every Sunday, wouldn't you? See, God knows how to exalt and abase. <laughs> Boom. <laughs> I really think I ought to be in that pulpit. What do you think, Jesus? All right, I put a little twinge in that uh, right leg. <laughs> His wonders to perform. That's right. And you know, Brother Jack don't question God. He says, okay, all right, well, maybe, the, maybe you need some practice. You preach, Brother Steve. I'm going to take it easy for a Take a sabbatical. He took a little sabbatical. He didn't leave town, but he was on sabbatical. And he's proud of his son in the gospel. He said, he's come a long way. That's right. Now, it's not without suffering. We're perfected by the things which we suffer. Just like Jesus was. Did you know Jesus was made perfect? That's right, by the things which he suffered. Amen. So you let God work on you. The more you want to do for him, the more probably you're going to get to suffer. And you know what Paul said? I count it all joy. All joy. Ho, ho, ho. Man, and I say the sufferings of this present world, they're not even worthy to be compared to the Glory, hallelujah, of that latter house. Yeah, he said, I'll do, I'll suffer. I'll, I'll, I'll do whatever I have to do to wake these people up. There was a doctor, you may be seated, I'm sorry, I'm not done. I mean, I'm done, I was done a long time ago, but I don't think God is. A long time ago, there was a doctor, and it was before, it was before they knew about germs. Yeah, I know, I'm sitting down, it's wild, isn't it? The devil's saying, what's going on here? I don't know what these people are going to do. What we're going to do, devil, is we're going to have revival. Amen. In spite of you. In spite of you. In spite of you. Amen. Submit yourself to God and resist the devil and he will flee. Amen. Don't ignore him. If you ignore him, he'll knock your head off. But you resist him. Submit yourself to God and to those he places over you. Resist the devil and he will flee. Amen. He knows, known unto God are all his works. Everything's planned out from the beginning of the world. He knows what Brother Steve's going to do. He knows what Brother Scott's going to do. He knows what every one of you are going to do. Amen. But let patience have a perfect work, that you may be perfect and entire, wanting nothing. Because when you get out there and working for God, you don't want to be wanting something. Say, wait a minute, God, I, didn't, I don't know how to handle this. He's not going to send you till you're ready. He's not going to use it until you can do it. You're not going to have babies until you're willing to raise them. I'm talking about spiritual children now. God's not going to give you spiritual babies if you're just going to put them on somebody's doorstep or take them to the pastor and say, here you go, pastor. Put them on the pastor's doorstep and say, here, you raise it. No. No, he, he'll feed the sheep, but the sheep have the lambs. Is that so hard to understand? I, you, that's why God put me on a farm. Amen. I was looking at that. I said, Really? There's going to be a little baby sheep. Oh, a little baby sheep. Yeah. Sheep have the lambs. Mm. But you know what? He, he's, 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 and when Zion travails, hallelujah, then sons and daughters are born into the kingdom. You see? So when you've got the heart, when you've got a heart, then God, God will send you somebody to disciple. When you have a heart that'll say, hey, man, it's... Man, it's five minutes till ten. We, you know, we ought to be here praying. You've got time to get here if you hurry. If you, Well, I thought I'd m maybe take the day off. No, you know what? No, I'll come and get you because you're my baby and I'm going to make sure. That's a parent. A baby will make sure that it's... A, a mama will make sure the babies are there. A daddy will make sure that, that you got everything you need. That's what dad always asked me. He'd always say, <clears throat> on his deathbed, the last thing he asked me was, is your car running okay? So said, okay, leukemia took him away from me <clears throat> at a young age. But you know what? He was still making sure that my car was running, everything was okay. You need anything? You need any money? 
That's right, my provider. He was there. He was my provider. Now, that's the way God is. Every day he wants, hey, are you doing okay? Are you going to be all right? Well, why don't you give, just call them today and see if they're feeling okay. You doing all right today? Just call them in the middle of the day. You're their parent. There are not many fathers in Israel. We got a lot of teachers. We got a lot of guys that love to get up and run their mouth and preach and show how much they know. But how many daddies do we have in Israel? That was the question the apostle Paul asked. Because he had a son named Timothy and a son named Titus. When he, when he, when he discipled somebody, they became his, his spiritual children. And he made sure that they had all that they needed. And he made sure they were, yeah, see, that's, that's a parent. And that's why churches aren't having spiritual babies. Because most churches, they're not fit mothers. Oh, my God. I'm going to quit. I wouldn't have said that. That was God's fault. Don't blame that on me. I'm not mad at you. I come to... I come to praise Caesar, not bury him, you know. I come to brag on you. But listen, God wants you to, he knows that you're going to be having babies someday. You need to learn to be a mama. You need to get in that kitchen and learn how to cook. You need to learn how to have those Bible studies in your home. Because that new baby can't go from Sunday to Sunday. The devil will kill him before they ever get back to church. I'm not kidding you. This, we're, not, we're not making a program here. We're not going to try to set up some man-made program of how to disciple. You don't need to know that. What you need to know is you need to love those babies like they were your own. And you set them on that couch. And you teach them the Word of God. And you make sure they're okay. Listen to them when they need to pour their heart out. Your preacher's not got time to do He's the shepherd. He feeds the sheep. But the sheep take care of the lambs. Hallelujah. See, there, there's a mama. I think a mama and a baby. Hallelujah. Is that right? Well, isn't that sweet? Look at that. I got that baby. The little baby just rocking. He knows he's all right. Mama's got him. He said, Mama, what's wrong with that man up there? Why is he so mad? Who's he screaming at? I'm sorry, little baby. I know. I need to speak with a gentle voice. Preach like your pastor. Praise the Lord, everyone. <laughs> I know I'll never out scream him because you know something? There's fire. Oh, he's got fire shut up in his bones. Amen. Just like the prophet. Who was it, Jeremiah? It feels like fire, he said. Shut up. Everybody say fire. Fire. Everybody say shut up. Shut up. Okay, I will. Let's stand. God bless y'all. I love you. <laughs> You've still got time to get to the steak and shake. <laughs> beat the crowd. I want you to beat the crowd. We love you. And this is the example, this mama and her baby. I want you to be like that in here with that spiritual baby swinging on your hip. Hallelujah. Watching them learn how to praise God and worship God. There's nothing like it, Brother Jack. Those new converts, when those new babies, those new believers begin to lift their hands for the first time and begin to say, I love you, Jesus. And you introduce them to their daddy. <laughs> For the first time. There's nothing like it. I'm going to get in my car and I'm going to drive as fast as I can to my, my daughter's baby shower. She's 34 and she's having my first grandbaby. Amen. Thank you. <laughs> it's, it, she's going to be a little girl and her name is Poppy. Yeah, I know. I know. It's 2016. We can expect anything to happen from now on. When they're not doing it like they used to, are they? Nothing's being done like it used to, but we got to let God do what he knows will work for today. We're going to let Jesus Christ be the same yesterday, today, and forever because he always knows just what to say, just what to do, and how to do it. And you're, we're going to get to be the ones that do it. This last day, the chosen generation, the, la the generation upon whom the ends of the world are come. You are special people. You're God. He chose you for this last day. We're going we're gonna, to we're gonna cross the finish line. We're the last lap. You always save the best and the fastest runners till the relay race. You always save the last. See, I don't know everything. You save the last runners till last. And we're taking the baton of truth. And we're going to cross the finish line for Jesus. And, and look. He's chosen you. Isn't that great? You ought to feel good about yourselves because Jesus does. He loves you.